Amen. Good evening, Kingdom Life family. Good evening. I see you there, Pastor Tim, Elder Tammy, Elder Robin. Good to see you on tonight. Elder Carlos. Amen. God is so good. I give you all the chance to come in the room to greet, greet one another. I see you, Elder Dockery. Of the Glennis, God bless you. All right, the Jordan Halls are in the in the room. Doctor Alexis, good evening. Pastor Sean, good to see you. Good to see you. Petersburg is in the house. Amen. Remind you to share with your friends, share with your family. Amen. Keep the comments going. Hello, Minister Katrina. Share, share, share. Amen. I pray that all of you have made it into the room or will make it into the room. Father, we thank you, God, for being the wonderful God that you are. I ask that you just continue to speak, Lord God, that you've been speaking this word, Lord God touch my mouth that I'll be able to articulate what you are saying to your people. God, touch their ears and their heart, our ears and our heart, that we will be ready to receive. Consecrate me now, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope. Let my will be lost in thine. Amen. Again, just thanking you all for coming on in tonight. We're going to get right into it tonight. Good to see you, Pastor D. Pastor D. Certainly enjoying preaching the word and enjoying all of the preachers and elders and pastors that have come for us. Uh, but my heart also misses my pastor and my pastor. Um, and I'm rejoicing already at their return. I'm going to be very excited to see them. Um, all right, we're going we're gonna to get into Psalms 91, our canopy of protection. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold, and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee. Neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Amen. I'm always thankful and grateful for God's protection, for God is can his canopy over me. I thank him that he does his part. And all I have to do is just count on him, trust in him, lean not to my understanding. And some all might think he knows some things, but as I begin to seek the Lord, to see how great he is and how much more he knows than I could ever know, how much more he can do than I could ever do. So I'm thankful for a God that is willing and able to be and do all that I need him to be and do. So I'm thankful for that. Tonight, um, we're going to get into our offering. As I was studying um, the lesson for tonight, I realized that part of the lesson goes well with the offering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scripture from the lesson and do that part first because it really, I believe, is applicable to our, to our time of giving. This is in Exodus, the 36th chapter, still in Exodus. 
36th chapter, I'm going to read the 5th through the 7th verse. It says, they went to Moses and reported, the people have given more than enough materials to complete the job the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave the command, and this message was sent throughout the camp. Men and women, don't prepare any more gifts for the sanctuary. We have enough. So the people stopped bringing their sacred offerings. Their contributions were more than enough to complete the whole project. And in this instance, they are bringing materials for this great project of, of building the, the temple that will ultimately house the ark, which will house the presence of God, will house that, that cloud that went in and out. And in this instance, the people are bringing their materials. They're bringing their materials for sewing, their materials for building, they're giving of their, their gold, their jewelry, they're giving them things. And the people gave so much that they had more than they needed to complete the job. Oh, what a wonderful testimony would it be if, if we were to say, okay, building fund, we, we, can't, we won't even have the building fund because the people have given so much. We've built everything that we needed to build here, and now we can start building and helping other churches and helping missions around the world even more. So I encourage you to look at those ways to give on the bottom of your screen through Cash App, through text giving, if you want to send in a check or money order to P.O. Box 6333, all these ways to give. I just encourage you to do like the people did. Look, they gave because they were excited about what was going to happen. They had made enough mistakes that they needed the presence of the Lord. And, and, and it got so bad that the God said, I'm going to send you, but I'm not going to go with you. And so now they have to build this temple that is going to house his presence. And now they have the opportunity to give towards that. So I encourage you to, to give of your, your financial resources when it comes time for food to happen. Give up your, of your food. Give up your talents. Be like they were in the 36th chapter of Exodus where we give so much that the cup runs over. That look, we, we pray that God would give to us that we, not, we don't have room enough to receive. But wouldn't it be great if the people that we gave to didn't have enough room to receive? If we gave so much to the church that there was overflow, even into other churches, even into other ministries. Oh, what a wonderful testimony that would be. Amen. So I'm going to give you a couple more moments to, to give, to get your checks ready, to write down, to reconsider how many zeros you're putting down on there. I'm going to grab a drink of water and we're going to get into this word. Amen. So here in Exodus, in the 36th chapter, what's going on? Um, title of this message here, we're still talking about, uh, about American idolatry. And right now we're talking about being between the rock and a holy place. Now we know in our story that there were some times where the people were caught between a rock and a hard place or between the, the Pharaoh's army and the river. We're going to be talking about being between a rock and a holy place. And so in our story here, um, the, the Israelites have, have been told to go forward. And, and then God said, I'm going to send my angel, but I'm not going to go with you. Because if I go with you, I might just destroy you along the way. And so God begins to speak to Moses. And he talks to Moses about the building of the temple and gives him instructions. And he gives instructions for them to give. And as we just read, the people gave of the materials and, and so that they had more than enough materials to give. And then Moses um, now has to go and to get her or, or a, a, a descendant of her. We're going to read in the 35th chapter. So we're going to back up just a little bit. The 35th chapter, the 30th verse. Exodus 35 and 30. Then Moses told the people of Israel, the Lord has specifically chosen Bezalel the son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of, tribe of Judah. So we know we talked about Hur um, a, a, some time back and, and how Hur and Aaron were, were in charge while Moses was away. And um, I asked the question, what happened to Hur? But we see here the descendants of Hur in action. And the Bible says in the 31st verse here, the Lord has filled Bezalel with the spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise and all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. 
He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And the Lord has given both him and Oholiath, son of Ahismach, the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach their skills to others. And so when it came time to build the temple, there needed to be some people who were gifted and skilled in building. And we see here uh, that Bezalel, the son of Uri, grandson of Ker, is very skilled not only in building, but he is also skilled in teaching others how to do all of the things that he can do. And so we had the people needing to give, and now we have the building happening. But why is this happening? It is because the temple needs to be built. Because in this instance, there needs to be somewhere to house the presence. And that's going to be the ark, which is going to be inside of the temple. And so the temple needs to be built. And we need some men and women of skill to do some, some building, some crafting, some sewing, and all of these things. And we need someone not only able to do these things, but skilled to teach others. Now, I asked the question, I received the question when I read this, what are you anointed to do? And who are you teaching to do it? We see here in the story, he was anointed. It says he was a master at every craft. And so some of us are, are what we call um, jack of all trades. Some of us have mastered different things. But as I read this and, and read how they're building the temple, I say, as we build up our temple, and we will talk about what the temple is, but as we build up our church, as we build up the people, as we build up even the sanctuary, um, as we do these things, uh, what is needed and, and what is your gifting in doing that? There was an announcement um, that has been going over the last couple few weeks. Um, and it said people are needed uh, for different ministries in the church. And it listed out Christian education and, and ushers ministry and all these different ministries that we have in the church. And so as I was reading this, that came to mind. And again, the question, what are you anointed to do and who are you teaching to do it? So I want to pause for a moment. And give you a moment. You can you can get a piece of paper and um, hopefully you already have something to write notes. And I just want you to think about what am I able to do? What am I really good at doing? And if it's something you're already doing in the church or already doing in your community or on your job, that's good. But also perhaps there's a skill that you that you use that you know how to use, but maybe you're not using it. And so just take a moment to, to think about you know what that skill might be. Now that you've thought about it, perhaps written it down, my question is, how can you use that skill to enhance the church? How can you use that skill to enhance, more importantly, the kingdom of God? So Kingdom Life Christian Church, our local church, but also the kingdom of God in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state, in your country. You know, what are the, the tools that God has given you? And now let's think about that 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 announcement that came, the different ministries in the church. Are there ministries perhaps um, that I could contribute to um, that are available? Uh, we, we, we have different ministries. We have, um, now we have the, the breakfast nook now that's there. Uh, we have greeters that are there. Um, there's, there's more to ministry than just the preaching, more to ministry than just being in a pulpit or, or being in front of an instrument or being something that it's in the foreground. There's nothing wrong with the foreground. There's nothing wrong with being in front, but there's also nothing wrong with the background. And God has given us many different abilities that sometimes will take us to the foreground, sometimes will take us to the background. But I would like for us to consider even begin being a bit creative on ways that we can help. Perhaps you're in education. Perhaps you can help with Christian education in the church. Perhaps you can help with the um, with the, the teens and teaching of the teens. There's many different things. Maybe you're good at organizing things. A and, and perhaps you may have a gift and you don't even know exactly how you can use it. This is where we begin to talk to one another because some of us are skilled in organizing. Moses had to hear a word from God and get a vision for what was going to happen. And then Moses had to tell the people not only to give, but what to give. And then he had to tell the people not only to build, but what to build, how to build it. So Moses, the man of God, received instruction from the Lord. 
But the thing that was awesome here is that the instruction that God gave was not only such that it was enough to build the temple, but it was specifically what the people were gifted to do. So God orchestrated, as Pastor Tim would say, on purpose, orchestrated a plan that involved the very skills that they had. And so one of the reasons uh, why Bezalel was able to be so skilled because God orchestrated a plan special for him. God knew even when her was on the scene that her was going to have some descendants that were skilled. And so my master plan always already has them in mind. When we even begin to look at Aaron and his descendants, God's master plan already had them in mind. So remember, God knows your ending before your beginning. God has a plan and a purpose for us. And he has that purpose for us before we're even in our, our parents' womb, in our mother's womb. And so you have a gifting that God has given you, but know this, God has already come up with a plan for how to use it. God has already come up with a strategy. And now what we have to do is we have to pray on that thing. We have to seek on that thing. We have to have practical conversations with people say, hey, I notice that I'm not really, I'm connected to the church, but I'm not connected to a ministry. Or maybe I was connected to a ministry, but I'm no longer connected with that ministry. How can I get not just connected with the church, but connected more with ministry? Look, more with the building of the temple, the building up of the church. Where do I fit in the vision that says that, um, that our, our, that people are waiting in line to get into this church, that every seat is packed. You know, what? where do I fit in that particular vision? And in this case, the people of God, they, they had some a, a few ways that they could fit in the giving and in the doing. So Moses had to say something, the people had to do something, and the people had to give something. We've been taught on that, to say something, to do something, to give something. What are you saying? What are you doing? And what are you giving? And then here is a crucial part. It says again in that 31st verse, he's had the ability, they had the ability to teach their skills to others. The reality of the situation is that as time goes on, we get older. As time goes on, we, we may used to be able to do uh, 50 different things in the course of a week. But as time goes on, responsibility increases. We get higher positions on the job, perhaps. And, and now the responsibility at the, at the job, because of our gifting, uh, because of what God has gifted us to do and, and being good stewards over that, but it's more now. And perhaps the, the, the amount of things we were able to accomplish um, on a weekly, daily basis has decreased a bit. Not that we're doing less, but that we're doing more and our capacity is less, but also sometimes that we age, right? And as we age, we, we may not be able to run as much as we used to. So where are our Joshua's that are available to learn what we learn? Just like Moses had a Joshua, we ought to have Joshua. Just like Bezalel had the people that he taught, we ought to have people that, that we teach. If you're a good cook, don't just keep all the recipes secret to yourself. Choose some to, you know, share some with others. There's some young up and coming cooks. I, I, I experienced recently a gifting and, and a lot of us know about the gifting of, um, of heavenly touch in our church. And, and I thank God for Crystal and, and her ministry, how she, she does hair. But um, recently I, I went to, to her, to the shop and she gave me what was called a detox. And, and I, I was able to see how a skill like doing hair and all of the other things that go into that could really be used for, for the glory of the kingdom. And so Crystal um, put and she, she began to wash my hair and she began to play just this soaking worship music. And all of a sudden I felt like I was in a very expensive spa being being treated on because the, 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 the gift of the woman of God was able just something as simple as, as washing of the hair and playing of music in the background. And I've heard others talk about this. Even my wife began to mention when she got her hair done um, that, that Crystal was able to create an atmosphere of worship, even in there. So this is a very creative way of taking one's gift and allowing it to be used not only for, for our monetary gain and, and for our occupation, but taking it a step further and really using it for the glory of God, 
that detox that I had, that, that moment of, of just worship and, and soaking worship music was very stress relieving right before ministering the word of God. And I was able to just lay back and meditate on what God was sending, meditate on what God was about to send, and really hear, I would say, even more clearly from God. So one, I am giving a plug for, for our sister Crystal and, and Heavenly Touch, but more than that, giving a plug for using your skills, being creative in how we use our skills for the uplifting of the kingdom, and then going into teaching others how to do it. Because eventually we do get older. Eventually we do pass away. And there needs to be a Joshua generation that is ready to carry on the torch. But how can they learn unless they be taught? Not only the word of God taught, but how do they cook? How do they keep the house? How do they keep the house of God? How do the, the, the chairs get lined up? What does the music sound up? Like, why do we play this music at the beginning of the service? How do we get the people's attention? How do we usher people to their seats? All of these things that we can kind of take for granted because we do them week in and week out. How do we now teach that to the next generation? Not only the children, but new believers, old believers, maybe someone who's learned of a new skill that they have. We have um, different things in our church on um, the the, you know, the pulpit area, we have a sound area. Well, someone gifted with the use of their hands had to take that gift and build those things. Similar to how Bezalel was, was building the temple, someone had to build even our church. The vision that God gave pastor was for a building that we're in now and we see it. But before that, this building looked nothing like it looks now. In fact, a lot of us were able to tour the building before it became it. And some of us were like, oh, wow. You know, how is this going to be a church? And others maybe saw the vision, but ultimately God had to send his vision through his man of God and people who were skilled had to work to build the place that we now worship in. Similar to what they were doing in Exodus, a temple was built. And now we are people who were, you know, at McClaw Circle, at, at Legacy Hall, who were kind of moving and, and setting up each Sunday. Now we have a place, a temple in which we can worship in a temple where we expect that the spirit of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, the, the glory cloud would be there to meet us there. Even when we are here, people skilled to build the temple, to run the temple and remember to teach their skills to others. And so whatever it is you wrote down that 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 you're skilled in doing. Now I begin to think, how can what can I do to teach this to others? Who can I teach? Who's available? What are opportunities uh, to, to, to teach what I have? I'm going to give you a, a moment to think about that. And perhaps as I'm as I continue to teach, you guys can share in the chat some things that, that God has gifted you to do and um, kind of a conversation that you can have that we can have amongst one another. Like what are ways that we can uh, bring our skills to to the church, but also I thank God for for Kingdom Life Christian Church, and I thank God for a church that I would say is not like an eighty twenty church. We're not a church where twenty people do eighty percent of the work, but I also am aware that sometimes some people do have to, to because of their gifting do more than others, and so I would encourage those of us that have gifting to offer up our gifting, but also. Those of us that are doing, don't just keep it to ourselves, but to work, to make and set aside time to teach that thing to others so that one, eventually they can take over, but also so that we don't have to be overwhelmed so that maybe on a week where we need to go visit mom who's in another state or, or go away that we can we can know that our, our, our station is covered. You know, uh, I mentioned that pastor has been, you know, he was able to vacation and and go spend some anniversary time and even do missions work. And um, you know, thankful for that. But in order to do that, there had to be people skilled to teach and not just pastor. And a lot of the things that he has taught us, not just from the pulpit, but in training and in sonship class, we were able to take what we were we were taught and to teach it. And that really is a measure of the maturity of, of a mature son to show to be able to teach what we have been taught. That is lessons. That is that is the word of God. But that's also how we run business, 
how we how we keep the church in order, how we play the music, how we usher people to their seats, all of these things, how we teach Joshua generation. All of these things are, are things that we need, we learn to do, and we teach others to do it for, for the advancement of the kingdom, but also specifically for the advancement of our house, Kingdom Life Christian Church, for your local church, our local church, so that it may be built up, so that it might be capable of handling even more people, even more situations, not just the size of the building, but our capacity to serve. I thank God for those in the breakfast nook. And I thank God for seeing new faces even there. It's a blessing when I begin to see um, just the gifts and talents that God has given us begin to stretch out, uh, begin to be used by, by others. Now, kind of back, that was a little bit of a sidebar, but back into the, the history of the lesson. Why are they building the temple? Because we need a place for God to dwell. We need this place that God is going to be in. And we see later in the, in the, in the, in the story, I'll say, that, that Moses, you know, he, he will leave the temple and the, the, the cloud will go into the, into the ark. And then when the cloud would leave the ark, it would show the people where to go. And so now the people have the presence of God leading and directing them. And they're not in the wilderness alone. But in order to do that, they had to build a temple. This is what I call the holy place, the temple, the holy place. What is the holy place? The holy place, I, I, I'll have three examples of the holy place. The third example we find as Jesus is talking to uh, the woman at the well. And he says to the woman in the well, this is in John 14 and 21. John 14 and 21. I'm sorry, John 4 and 21. John 4 and 21. It says, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. The father is seeking such as these to worship him. And so Jesus is speaking of a time when worship will not be confined to the mountain. Worship will not be confined to Jerusalem, to home, to the temple. Um, hearing from God will not just be confined um, to the typical place, but we will find a time where it will be new people worshiping, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And now we find ourselves even able to worship. And so that holy place um, really becomes where we worship. And for some of us that is in our home right now, even in your home, that holy place it, it is really just where we are, where we carry his presence. And the awesome thing I, I love about this is in the in our Old Testament story, we see that they had to build the temple in order to house the pres to house the presence. But now we find that we have become the temple that can house the presence. And so we can take the presence wherever we go and allow it to lead us from within. That's one example of the temple. Another example of the holy place uh, is our actual church. So for us, that's um, Kingdom Life Christian Church. Um, and for others, that's the church that you go to. That is a holy temple, it should be a holy temple, a place where we can come to worship, a place that we can come to, to gather together and, and to learn about God, to, to teach about God. This is a holy place. And then the other holy place, and this is a very crucial holy place. And that is our body. And the Bible says, you know, know you that your body is the temple of the living God. You know, we know that our body is the temple of the Lord. And so this right here is the holy place. Wow, what a large transition from being in the wilderness and God saying, I will not go with you because if I go with you, I will destroy you to now saying, I'm not only going to go with you, but I'm going to live inside of you. This is your holy temple. This is that holy place. And so we know that one, we have to live holy, but we also have to take care of our temple. That is spiritually take care of it, but also that's naturally take care, taking care of it and doing the things that our doctor says and, and, and getting physical trainers if we need it and learning to eat more healthy. You know, th this word is not just for you, but it's for me, 
for me also, taking care of our physical temple so that we're able to do the things. You know, I talked earlier about those skills. And, and as we get older, we may not be able to do as much. But if we take really good of our temple, that decline will happen a lot slower. And we meet them. I know we've all seen somebody in their 60s and their 70s moving like they're in their 40s. You know, someone in their 50s moving like they're in their 30s because they take such good care of their temple, of their body. And they're able to do more. And so there's a spiritual taking care of the temple. But then there's also the natural, um, even the practical, where we know that hey, if I can run further physically, that means I can... Whether it's I can stay in service long, you know, long after service is gone, I can be on hidden hands and have energy even after a long weekend to help clean the church, um, have energy to serve in a soup kitchen because physically I'm in better condition. And so we take we want to take good care of the holy place. Now, we've arrived at the holy place, but how did we and how do we get to the holy place? And that is the rock that I want to talk to you about a little bit. Now, we know in the New Testament that this rock is the chief cornerstone. This The, the rock that the, the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And so we can even look for, a, 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 in a sense, that the literal rock um, that one might use um, to build a building has become the spiritual rock to help build our temple. And so there's an importance in this rock. And I want to dig deeper about the rock in our lesson. And so we're gonna read in Exodus, the 17th chapter in the fifth verse. And it's gonna be five through seven. And I know we're doing a, a lot of reading today, tonight, but there really is only one way to study the Bible and that's to study the Bible. So we're gonna read some scriptures and we're gonna study this Bible. Exodus, the 17th chapter, verse five. The Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people Take your staff, the one you use when you struck water in the Nile, and call some of the Israel, elders of Israel to join you. I will stand before you on the rock of Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and water will come gushing out. Then the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Moses named the place Massah, which means test, and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of God argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? So we see a constant theme here um, in this story where the people are saying, is the Lord here with us or not? Something else has happened. And now they find themselves in a land that doesn't have, um, there's no water to drink. And they're complaining that they are thirsty. And so Moses is instructed by God to strike the rock and water comes out of this rock. Now, even at the story that I mentioned earlier about at the, at the woman at the well, when he says, you know, you, you worship, you know, not just in Jerusalem, in the mountain, um, we, we see that um, th there's an exchange or a conversation about water. And he says to her, if you to ask, I would have give you a water, basically a water that won't run out. We know that Jesus is a water that won't run dry, run dry, a water that won't run out. He he is the one that fills our thirst. Confusion often happens because we find ourselves in a thirsty state and a needy state and not really understanding what we need. Um, I've often been thirsty and, um, you know, anyone who's ever been in the hot sun, you find you want a cool drink, right? And, and when you go to get a cool drink, some of us might get a soda and we find we drink the soda. We feel like we got a little bit satiated. But we're very thirsty again very soon. And we find over time that the soda seems to re be rehydrating us, but it's actually serving to dehydrate us. Because the best water is water. And we find sometimes we need the water, the water that the woman at the well experienced. We need the water, but we're going after other drinks. And we're thirsty, but we're going after other drinks. We need to find the same wa the water that gushed out of the rock. And so now the rock, a rock that could be used to build a temple, has become the rock that has built our temple. And inside that rock, which is Jesus, is water enough to quench our thirst. This water is doing two things. One, it is quenching thirst for people that are thirsty. 
But more than that, it is reminding of people that God is with us. Because they said in here in the seventh verse, Moses called, he named the place after them, called it, called it test and arguing because they argued with Moses and they tested God saying, is he here with us or not? God, where are you? And we have to be careful in our search for God that we don't look for other things. These are things that have been laid out to us as idols in these lessons that we've been learning. So that we don't go to idols. Instead, we go to the true God, which is our God. We go to God the Father, whose son Jesus died for our sins, that the Holy Spirit might live inside of us. This is the water that we need. And so the people find themselves here at the rock needing some water. And the rock is struck and water comes out. But just like these people, we find ourselves not only just thirsty sometimes, but also hungry. And if we go back into the 16th chapter, we see again, this is Exodus 16 and 11. And again, we're going to read the Bible. Then, Lord says, then the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the Israelites' complaints. Now tell them in the evening you will have meat to eat and in the morning you will have all the bread you want. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And, and so we see here again, the people are complaining that they didn't have food to eat. And so the Lord supplied two things. He supplied bread in the morning and meat for the evening. They now have food to eat. Now this bread, that they experienced, you know, if we read further into it, we find it's called manna. And it was named because it's something they really didn't quite know what it was. I, I liken the, the word manna to almost like a genesis qua, like what 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 is it? This this kind of like a grand crack graham cracker like thing that they were able to, to eat. And even as we look in the in the story and we read further and get through Exodus and Leviticus and into Numbers, we see the people even complaining now. Because in Exodus, they're complaining that they don't have anything to eat. In Numbers, they're complaining, we, we're having too much of the same thing. I'm sick of eating manna all the time. You know, I, I had a, a friend, we discussed this one time. He said, it reminds me of a movie of Forrest Gump, you know, it's shrimp, shrimp salad, shrimp kebab, all these different types of shrimp. Well, they were having manna for breakfast, manna for lunch. Now, here's the thing about the manna. God instructed them. He said, gather the manna. And when you gather it, gather just enough for one day. And then when you gather it um, for one day, you know, you eat from that. And then the next day you will gather more. With the exception of the sixth day, the sixth day you will gather enough uh, for the weekend. I believe they gather the same amount on the sixth day, but God will multiply it. And so, but so that they could rest on the seventh day, um, they were able to gather. Um, um, there was enough on the sixth day to cover them the sixth and the seventh day. Now, with the manna, if they were disobedient, the manna would basically spoil and get maggoty um, the next day. And so the manna that they, for today, was not, was not edible for them the next day. Now, we know that Jesus is our bread. He's our, our daily bread. And we know he himself has said, um, we shall not live on bread alone. This is what he said when he was being tempted um, in his wilderness experience. He said, man shall not be live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father, out of the mouth of God. And so we know that we need not only a literal bread, a food bread, but a spiritual bread. I liken this to the bread that they received here in the wilderness, a bread that came daily and a bread um, that they were able to eat during the day. We all need our daily bread. What is our daily bread? That is a word from God for the day. Now, hear me. This is not, I come on, this is not just, I come on Sunday and receive a word for the week. We're going to get into that. But I'm talking about a word for the day. And we know your pastor is not with you seven days a week. And, and so you need to be able to, to find a word for yourself during the week. And this is not necessarily a difficult thing. There are many devotionals that are out there um, that we can read. Um, we can you know, begin to hear God even for ourselves to, to write down what he has for us for a devotion. But this is our daily devotion, our time in the word to get a word for the day, our daily bread. So I should be in my word every day. 
Now, right now, I'm going to talk about it, but right now, I'm not talking about even the deep studying of the word as much as I'm talking about it, just making sure you read something that's going to help you through the day. This is something you might do quick in the morning, quick on your lunch break. A quick could be five minutes, could be an hour, but just something that you work into your daily routine to get a daily bread for today, knowing that tomorrow I need to do the same thing to get a daily bread for tomorrow. So I should be in my word every day. I should have a time of praise and worship every day. And then there's also, I'll say the prayer version of the daily bread, because we also need to be praying daily. And again, there's a prayer that we pray. There's an intercession that we pray, a deeper prayer that we might pray, a longer prayer that we might pray. But there's, there's also, I would say a throughout the day prayer um, that we need to pray. You know, you might find yourself driving the driving the work. You know, instead of you know yelling, talking, perhaps cursing at the people in a road rage, road rage. I'm talking to the Father, talking through throughout my day. This little five minutes here, five minutes there. This is a daily bread that we need through prayer, through praise and worship, and through reading the Word. This is the manna from heaven that God will send. And we have to be careful that in that routine. We don't get, I would say, tired of it. You know, I, I do the same devotion every every morning. Well, that puts us in a place like the in, in Numbers when they were saying to the Lord, you know, we're tired of eating manna all the time. All we eat is manna. Give us something else to eat. And, and so know that your routine, it's okay to spice up your routine. Maybe use a different devotional. Um, if you're a woman, use a woman's devotional specific for women. If you're a, ch uh, a, a young child, use a specific devotional for teens, a, a, a devotional for husbands, a devotional for fathers. When you finish that one, you know, we are we are different. We, we are different people. right? I'm a father. Uh, I'm a husband. I'm a manager at work. I'm a, I'm a praise and worship leader at work. I'm a, I'm a preacher. So that's about five different you know types of devotionals that I could find right there. And, and so there's a, a plethora of resources out there. No, re, no reason why uh, we shouldn't have access to a, a good devotional for us. And then God said, um, still in Exodus in the 16th chapter, he says, in the evening, you will have meat to eat. So in the morning, they have bre all the bread they want. And in the evening, they have meat to eat. Now, we have now, we have lights. We have electricity. Back then, they didn't have electricity. So even though, and we can kind of see as we're getting to fall and, and, and go towards winter and the, the daylight hours are, are less and it's getting darker earlier. Well, when it's darker earlier, we can, in a sense, we can't do as much or the same things that we did when it was lighter. It's kind of easier when, it, when it's light outside and we can see. So for them, night was was different, though. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have HVAC and, and, and central heating. So when that fire came at, at night, they needed that fire. Um, they, need, they needed that fire. And so here we see the, the meat. They have the meat in the evening. I liken this to hard times in life, times that are not necessarily as easy as others. What gets us through that is the meat of the word. So we have a daily a daily routine like thing that we do that gets us through the day, day to day. But then we have to eat meat so that we are strong enough when hard times come, when evening in the evenings in our life come, when nights in our lives come. This is a meat that we get from a, the preacher on a Sunday that, you know, in its regard, maybe carries us to a Wednesday to the next Sunday. But th this is a, a word that I hear from God that is going to get me through the a, a, a season that I'm in. Get me through a night, a hard, a difficult season that I'm in. This is a meat of a praise, even through a difficult situation. And this is a meat, a hearty prayer that gets myself and others through a situation. You know, when Paul and Silas prayed at midnight, at midnight, everybody's bands were loose. This is an everybody's bands are loose kind of prayer. Well, we don't we 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 name and mention lots of different people, not just my four and no more. When we get deep into intercession, and um, you know, we, we do not have intercessory prayer uh, this Saturday, but on sec on typically most most, with the exception of this one coming up, most second Saturdays of the month, we have intercessory prayer. Prayer. It is a place not only where we get to intercede and pray, but there's always good lessons about intercession. And we know that is Pastor D's wheelhouse anyway. So we are eating some good meat 
about the meat. We're eating meat about praying, uh, having about, about having a meaty prayer. And so thanking God for the, the meat in the evening. So God gave them daily bread and meat. We get to the 17th chapter. He gives them water that's coming out of this rock. This saying that rock is the, you know, Matthew 12 says um, the stone that the builders rejected have now become the corner, the cornerstone. And this is the Lord's doing. And it is wonderful to see. You know, I hear pastors say this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes for your reference. I'm sorry. That's Matthew 12 and 42. It says, you know, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's wonderful. Lord. It's, it's marvelous in our eyes. So we're talking about that rock. We're talking about how that rock has become the chief cornerstone of the temple and has even become the temple for us. Now, one thing I, I saw here that I like, we see in the Old Testament, in order to have the presence of God, they had to build the temple. And the building of the temple now allowed God's presence. But now we find that it is getting into his presence that allows us to build the temple. Let me say that again. We see in our Exodus story that building the temple allowed them to go into God's presence. But now we have free access to his presence. So we get into his presence. And as we get into his presence, now the temple is built up. What do I mean by that? We talked about three different types of temple. The temple that is just where we go, where we are, the world, the church at large. Um, that temple gets built up as we get into his presence. Our church gets built up as we get into his presence. And then our body, our, our physical, spiritual temple here gets built up as we get into his presence. And so we talk about even those skills and being anointed. But notice how in the Old Testament, they are anointed to build the temple and they use the anointing now to, to be able to do something that allows his presence to come in. But now we find it a bit flipped because it is the, um, the presence of God that we get into that now allows us to be anointed. Let me say that again. Old Testament, they use their skill. They use their skill to build the place to house the presence. Now, what we do is we get into his presence and it is in his presence that we now receive anointing and increase in skill. And so as I begin to, as I have now free access to his presence, free access to daily bread, free access to the meat of the word, as I get into the word, as I get into his presence more, as I go into the holy place, now I my temple is being built built up. Now my abilities are being built up. Now my wisdom is being built up. Now those around me are being built up. I'm getting into the presence. And the getting into the presence is now what allows me to become more anointed, allows me to become more skilled. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray. We deal with some difficult situations. You know, even in that scripture, they were asking, you know, why, why is was, with the daughter of our people, I believe it was, why is she not healed? Why is our land not healed? And the, and the Bible makes it clear, if my people would humble themselves, would pray, would do something, as, as Reverend Jesse Jackson says, do something revolutionary and turn from their wicked ways, if we would seek his face, if we would do these things, then he would heal our land. Then our temple would be healed. Then our anointing and our skill would grow. If we seek after him, if we do what Pastor Tim said, if we go into his presence, if we practice his presence, if when the pressure comes, we press into his presence, if we do these things and treat his presence as if it is important, that allows us now to be able to do what we need to do, but it also us allows us to do what the Israelites failed to do often and what I believe we sometimes fail to do. And that's just to remember that he is. The Bible says that we must know that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But knowing that he is is simply that. And many times in the scripture, we, we see them saying, is God still with us? Where is the Lord? Where is Moses? 
over and over again, this wondering of, is God with us? And we sometimes have our wonders. Maybe we might not doubt anymore that God is real. But when we begin to do things, we wonder, is God in this thing that I'm doing? Sometimes we, we, we hear from God very clearly and we know and we go running. But then there's other times we, we think we heard from him and we're not sure. Or maybe someone gave us a word that we're not sure of. This is where presence, pressing into his presence becomes crucial because I need to know not just that the Lord is, but that he is in whatever I'm about to do. Now, the Israelites got some things interesting and some things wrong, but one thing they got right is to say, Lord, if you don't go with us, we are not going to go. And that's one thing I want to know. God, this thing that I think you're calling me to do, I need you to show me, God, that you are with me. And in the meantime, I'm going to move forward with the things that you've told me to do, which is press into your presence. And the thing about God is that if we meet him where he is, he will meet us where we are. We got to remember God is God and God has a standard and that standard must be met in order to meet him. But I'm thankful for Jesus Christ and him dying for our sins and him becoming the advocate for our sins. And we don't have to do all of those things that the Israelites had to do in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and so on uh, because Christ has done those for us on the cross, the rock, has become our rock. The rock has become our water. The rock has become our daily bread. The rock has become our evening meat. The rock that has become our chief cornerstone. And the rock now lives inside of the holy place, inside of the temple. And so now I found myself now caught between a rock and a holy place instead of a rock and a hard place. I find myself caught between a good thing and a good thing instead of a bad thing and a bad thing. If I would just press into to practice his presence, I find myself with the rock. I find myself fed with water, fed with bread, fed with meat. And these things help now to mature me. The Bible talks about the, the, the sincere milk of the word, but it also talks about the, the meat, the meat of the word. And so we have to get into that meat of the word, that meat of worship, that meat of praise. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the 13th verse. I know I'm one that usually likes to stay still in the scripture, but God was just sending so much and I wrote down all that I could. But Hebrews 5 and 13. It says, for everyone who lives on milk is still an infant, inexperienced in the message of righteousness. And then the 14th verse says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained their senses to distinguish good from evil. And so by constant use of solid food, mature food, now we better know good for evil from evil. Now we better know right from wrong. Now we better are able to discern holy from unholy. Now we're able to try the spirit and see whether it be of God because we have not only gotten on that meat, that solid food, but the Bible says who by constant use have trained their senses. And so we know that this sincere milk, I talked about the daily bread and I said how the daily bread is something you know, quick that we can get and, and, and do it daily. But now the Bible is, is pushing us a step further to say that that meat it's something that we need more often. It's not enough to just have a deep study once a, a, once a month. Now, if we're still dealing with itty bitty problems and, and, and itty bitty situations, then maybe just a little bit of the meat of the word might seem good enough. But you know, at the, it seems like the, the more we grow, the, the stronger devils seem to try to come at us. And, and the more we get delivered from one thing, the more other things try to come at us. And so by constant use of the mature meat, the solid food of the word, our senses now get trained. And now when the devil comes at me, I can recognize him before he gets there because I begin to be able to recognize patterns because I've read about those patterns in the in the word. Now when others come with, with questions, I have more answers than questions because I've studied them in the word because I've realized that there's only one way to study the Bible and that is to study the Bible. There's a lot of conversations we can have and they're important. There's meditating that we can do and that's important. But how do you know, I can't meditate on the word I've read 
unless I read the word. And so that reading of the word, that getting into the meat of the word is very crucial. Now, as we come into closing, we talked about the rock and we talked about the striking of the rock. And we're going to go to, to, to Numbers, the 20th chapter. We're coming to a close here. Numbers, the 20th chapter. And the ninth verse. I'm going to read here a few verses. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from this rock? So now they're at a rock again. And they're thirsty again. And they're complaining again. And then Moses raised his hand and struck the rice rock twice with the staff. And water gushed out. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. The issue here is that God, in this, we read back a little of uh, some of the previous verses, God told Moses to speak to the rock. And instead, Moses strikes the rock. And those of us that either are Bible scholars or have listened to Bible scholars, we understand, or just reading the word here, uh, we understand that this is the action, or we believe, that, that kept Moses from going into the promised land. It says in the 12th verse, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am, I am giving you. Um, and so because Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, Moses doesn't go into the promised land. Now, what like what I ask myself, like, God, what does that have to do with Moses? Like Moses did a lot. What is the significance here? And I did some study and, I, and, and what I found and what I hear from the Lord is that in Exodus, when Moses strikes the rock, we talk about the rock being the chief cornerstone and the water comes gushing out. This is symbolic that Jesus died, the rock died and gave us life. The rock died and became that well of water. And so the striking of the rock is the stripes and the crucifixion of Christ. But this is the thing, you know, we sin many times, but Christ died once. And because Christ died once, we are now saved from sin. And so the striking of the rock was meant to happen just once. But we see here that Moses has now struck in the rock twice. And we believe it says he struck the rock twice. But we believe the first time was in Exodus and the second time was in Numbers. So not that in, in Numbers, he struck it twice for a total of three times. But in Exodus, he struck it once. It should have been one and done. But he struck it again in Numbers, which now gives a confusing message to those of us who look at the striking of the rock as this single one-time crucifixion of Christ and that we see the striking of the rock again. But we still know that Christ was just crucified once. But then I read in the word, I got to search through my notes here, Hebrews, the sixth chapter. We were just in Hebrews 5. We move forward to Hebrews 6 and 5. It says, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in Holy Spirit, shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tested the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and uphold and holding him up to public shame. I believe the King James Version says they crucify Christ afresh. And so we in this situation, after we have received repentance of our sins um, and, and received Christ and believe that he has died and now have gone on to experience the holy things to choose to backslide is to do what Moses did. And the 20th chapter of Numbers is to strike the rock again, is to crucify Christ afresh. And that's what happens when we willfully sin, when we know better and we willfully sin. And we see in the 20th chapter that even though Moses, now we know Moses made it into what we call the, the hall of faith. And, and Moses is revered as one of, if not the greatest prophet. So Moses does have his reward. But there's a part of this reward of the milk and honey. And that land that Moses did not receive because he crucified Christ afresh. And when we crucify Christ afresh, there are some blessings 
that don't come our way. There are some opportunities that we miss. There are some things that we would have been able to accomplish that we won't be able to accomplish. Now, I, I talked to my wife about this concept. And really, this is, this, this is I'm, I'm say this and I'm gonna let you go. Uh, this concept in movies, and we see the star of the movie often in crazy situations and live through those situations. And we wonder, like, how did, how did the other person not live through that situation? And now he's in a worse situation, she's in a worse situation, and they live through that situation. And, and those stars of the movie have what is called plot armor, meaning they are so integral to the story that they can't die or leave the movie at that point in the movie because then the movie would not be able to go on without them. And so really the explanation as to why they survived that situation is because they had plot armor. And I think sometimes as Christians, we think that we have plot armor, meaning as long as there's a, some other things that I'm supposed to do for the Lord, as long as he has a purpose for me, that I can do what I want because I got more time as long as there's things left undone. I have a plot armor that says everything is going to be perfect in life. Everything is going to happen the way I want it. But the reality is while all things work together to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, those things work out for the good. But the reason they have to work out for the good is because sometimes some bad things happen. And sometimes it's because of our neglect. And sometimes is because we think we have plot armor and we think we can get away with certain things and we think that, you know, that we just have this invincibility about us because we are children of God. But the reality is we go through some of the things, same things that, that sinners go through in life as, as far as trials and tribulations. We just handle them a lot differently. And so this salvation that received, this rock, this water, this bread, this meat, it doesn't exempt us from the problems, the vicissitudes of life. But what it does, it allows us to have word, to have meat to handle it. It says again, who by constant use have trained their senses. And so our senses become trained. Spiritually, we become trained and able to receive from the rock, able to maintain our holy place in the midst of an unholy world. God, I thank you. We thank you for this word that you have sent. I thank you that you allowed me to go through and complete it. I didn't know that if I would. Thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for um, sending to me. I love you so much. Bless your people that they would receive what you have for them, that I would receive what you have for me. Love you so much, God. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. I love you. See you Sunday. Amen.